today we're doing Genesis 1 to 26, which is on page 3 of your Bible, but the proper first page. Uh, and you can also read it in your book fifth if you'd like. So, okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seeds in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light to the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures And let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. And fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good afternoon. Just had to check my watch there. It is actually after 12. Uh, If we have not yet met, my name is Becca Fairley, and I am on the preaching team here at Holy Trinity. It's really nice to meet you all. Today, we are starting a new sermon series. Um, And on your uh, seats around you, we've produced a little booklet. These are for you to keep if you would like. They'll have all the chapters that we're going to be studying over the next few weeks. And there's even space to write, draw, and dream if that's your thing. So these are for you. Do use them as you would like to. One of the reasons we're going to be studying Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, is because what we believe and understand about Genesis shines a light on what we believe and understand about the whole Bible. 
which in turn shines a light about how we live out our faith in the world. So it's pretty important stuff, I would suggest, uh, and it seems pertinent at this point to ask for God's help as we begin this sermon series. So would you join me as we pray? Let's pray together. Creator God, thank you so much for your word and all that you long to teach us through it. Holy Spirit, would you just come and hover over us today? Open our ears, open our hearts, and we pray for a rich harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been in church for any length of time, you might have some big questions about Genesis, particularly, can I suggest, Genesis chapter 1. Maybe you're curious about the relationship between science and faith. How do those two sit together? Or maybe you're looking at this text and you're thinking, what is the best way to interpret this? Is this literal? Should we interpret it literally? Is it metaphor? Is it something else? What do we do with this text? Um, if you're a parent, and I suspect there are probably fewer of you in this particular service, but if you are a parent, maybe you will have had the question, um, were Adam and Eve real people? Why aren't dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible, mummy? Uh, or in my case, literally this last week, just sitting down to eat my porridge, um, why do we not have talking snakes anymore? I was like, this is too early. I do not know. Go and ask your children's church leaders. Let me start by saying uh, that today's sermon won't address all of these questions. Spoiler alert, dinosaurs will not be featuring, I apologize. Um, if you are, however, someone who really likes to grapple with science and faith, and I suspect uh, being in Cambridge, there are, that's quite a lot of you, um, can I offer two resources for you? Uh, the first of all is our vicar. Stuart. <laughs> that is what's known as outsourcing. Um, I studied theology at university. Stuart studied natural sciences, specializing in chemistry. Someone had to. Um, he's done a lot of reading in this area on science faith, and he assures me that he would like nothing more than to have discussions with a capital D with anyone who would like to explore this further. So that's the first resource. The second, um, if you'd like to explore more but maybe aren't up for a discussion yet about it, is this book, um, The Lost World of Genesis 1, Ancient Cosmology and the Origins Debate. It's a catchy title. Um, it is very sciencey. That's a technical word. Um, but I read it uh, as someone who is not sciencey. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Really engaged. So thoroughly recommend that book. So, to Genesis one. Where do we even start? Well, by way of introduction, uh, I'd like to tell you uh, about a period in my life from 15 years ago. Um, my now husband and I were both working in London, and that's where we met. Um, but he pretty quickly moved uh, to China after meeting me. Those two events were not related, okay? Um, he got a job in Shanghai, um, which meant that we spent the majority of our dating and indeed our engaged lives uh, on separate continents. Pros and cons to that approach, pros and cons. Um, in those days, can you imagine it, Zoom hadn't been invented, I know. Um, the internet was pretty sketchy for Skype, uh, and phone calls were a challenge both for the expense and the time difference. It's always a challenging one, that one. Um, so what we did was we wrote to each other actual paper and actual pens. I know, it's mind-blowing. Um, we wrote extensively. We're talking sort of seven or eight-page letters twice a week. I know, how do we have the time? We made time. It was young love. Um, and if you were to go to our home, you would find a box, um, a rather beautiful box, it has to be said, and in the box are all of Tom's letters to me. Tom is uh, my husband. I'm, I'm not sure where my letters are, but that's <coughs> by the by. Now, I'd like you to imagine 200 years into the future. So we've gone 15 years in the past. We're now going 200 years uh, into the future. A distant relative of ours uh, has done some digging into her family tree. And she discovers that she has a distant relative called Tom. Um, and what's more, Tom was a lawyer, and not just any lawyer, one of the top legal minds of his generation. Uh, and this excites our relative because she herself is training to be a lawyer. 
what are the chances? And she remembers this box of letters and she thinks, oh my goodness, they have been written, they were written by Tom, the lawyer. And she thinks, this is perfect. Here I have direct access to a brilliant legal mind. I'll read these letters and learn what it takes to be a lawyer. I'll get advice on drafting contracts and negotiating deals and answering emails at 3 a.m. And so she starts to read Tom's letters. But as she does so, our distant relative gets more and more frustrated. She can't find anything about the law in these letters. There's no legal advice, there's no wisdom on writing contracts, there's nothing. And in the end, she throws these letters aside and says, these are useless, and gets rid of them all. But here's the thing. Tom's letters were never intended to be an explanation of what it means to be a lawyer, or to offer any sort of legal advice. To get the best out of these letters, to really understand them, our relative would need to understand Tom's reason for writing them. And Tom's reason for writing them was to write to his girlfriend and then fiance to tell her how much he loved her, to share his hopes and dreams for their future lives. Uh, when I told this story this morning, my husband was sitting down there sort of so mortified. He's not here now, though, so it's fine. Um, these letters Whilst Tom may have a top-class legal mind, these letters were never intended to be a legal instruction manual. And if you don't understand that, you'll never really see the point of why they were written. And at best, you'll be a little bit perplexed by the letters. And at worst, you'll be deeply disappointed in them. Which brings us to Genesis 1. Genesis 1 was not actually written to address our modern scientific concerns and questions. And actually, reading Genesis 1 as a scientific account of how the world started is a relatively modern approach. John Calvin, the John Calvin, great Protestant reformer and Bible commentator, said of Genesis, he who would learn astronomy and other recondite arts let him go elsewhere. In other words, questions about how the world was actually made, the nuts and the bolts and the scientific theories, were never intended to be answered by Genesis 1. And if we read the text wanting answers to the how questions, we'll come away at best feeling a bit perplexed and at worst feeling deeply disappointed and inclined to disregard the text altogether. So, if Genesis 1 was not written as a scientific document as we understand science, what is it? Why was it written? Well, scholars date Genesis to around 2000 BC. There's a bit of wiggle room there. And it was written in the ancient Near East. And among the cultures of the time, including that of Mesopotamia and the early Babylonian Empire, there were stories of the origins of the world. Now, these were not just folk tales that a few people knew. These were woven into the very fabric of society. They were a way of telling people who they were and why they existed. And it's important to know this because Genesis follows the same model of these creation accounts. But, and here's the key thing, the author, under the influence and power of the Holy Spirit, we believe that the Bible is God's word breathed to us, the author makes very intentional and deliberate changes. The author was writing to a group of people to say, the culture and society that we live in says this about who you are and your place in the world. But that is not the truth. That is not the truth. Let me show you what is. And that is important because it's foundational to your faith, to your identity, to everything. And that's true for us too. Get the foundations wrong and everything that we build on them is at risk of collapsing. So, that begs the question, what is the truth that the author of Genesis is wanting to teach us? Well, having done quite a bit of study on this chapter, I'd like to say there is so much. This is a rich, rich chapter. 
But for today, we're going to look at two things, two truths that the author of Genesis is wanting to teach us, and both these truths are about God. And this is the first truth. There is only one God. There is only one God. Look at verse 1 with me. In the beginning, God. Let's pause there. (laughs) In the beginning, God. Or as another translation puts it, first this, God. First this, God. The very first thing that the author of Genesis is wanting to say is that there is only one God. This is in direct contrast to the other creation accounts of the day. Those accounts did not begin with God. They began with gods, plural. A vast array of gods and goddesses, including, incidentally, the very powerful sun and moon gods, which is why, if you noticed in verse 16, the author does not name the sun and moon. He just names the greater light and the lesser light. That is really intentional. What's he doing? He's saying, there is no wriggle room here, guys. There are no other gods, just one, God. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's great, Becca. Um, I'm not really sure you needed to make this into a whole point in your sermon. I mean, we're all sitting in church, probably largely monotheists. We probably believe in one God. We're, we're okay with that. Here's the thing. I think if we, we rush over the truth and the implications of one God at our peril, this statement that there is only one God was and still is so important to the Jews that it formed the basis for the Shema, the daily prayer that was said in the morning and the evening every day, based on Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is... Nice, thank you. You were here this morning, though, so it doesn't count. (laughs) This was the prayer that Jesus, being a Jew, would have said twice a day, every day for the entirety of his life. And when Jesus was asked... What is the most important commandment? How does he begin? He recites the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is? There we go. First this, God. So, why is this so important? Why does the author of Genesis want to state this before anything else? Well, by way of illustration... Uh, Let me tell you about our new kitten, Hazel. Um, We have a new kitten because, sadly, Matilda is no more, but we'll move on from that. It's all very happy. Hazel's wonderful. We love her very, very much. Um, And like many small creatures, um, Hazel loves to play. One of her favorite toys, well, it's essentially a stick, but it's a stick with interest. It's a sort of stick, and at the end of the stick is a long piece of string. The end of the string is a little ball. And so what you can do is you can hold the stick. Uh, actually, you can remain sitting for this. It's quite relaxing. You just sort of wiggle the stick around, and the ball dances all over the place, and Hazel gets terribly excited. Um, and what, what you can do is you can sit there, and a fun thing to do is to lift the stick so that the ball dangles just slightly beyond her reach, thereby forcing Hazel to stand up on her hind paws. Then you sort of wiggle it around, and Hazel darts, for want of a better word, around, whilst on her hind paws. And you keep wiggling it, and Hazel keeps dancing, and eventually um, she wobbles and falls over. Which, now that I'm saying it out loud, does sound a little cruel. It's fine, it's fun. She's purring. You know, I'm not purring, but we're having fun. This is, it's a fun activity. Why does Hazel wobble and fall over? Because Hazel doesn't know where to commit all her energy. Should I go here? Should I go here? Should I go here? She gets so excited and she keeps darting around and eventually she becomes completely destabilized and she falls over. Why does the author of Genesis begin with one God? Because he knows that when we allow other gods to demand our worship, and by worship I mean our time, our energy, our money, our our focus, our adoration, when we allow other gods, whether it is the Mesopotamian womb goddess or the gods of sex, money, power, social media today, whatever they are, we will always become destabilized. Who's in charge? Where should I commit my time or money? Who should I listen to? Who has the right to speak into my life? 
Who gets my time and my energy, my adoration, my focus? At this point, I'd like to also say a little note to students, because there are quite a few of you here today. We love students, by the way. Welcome. Can I suggest that this is a really good time to decide to just worship one God? Because I promise you, at university, you will never, ever face quite so many other gods demanding your time and your attention and your money. Who gets to speak into your lives? You get to decide that now. Can I suggest you make a stand now and go, there's only one person who decides how I live, how I spend my money, how I spend my time. One person, God alone. When we worship other gods, we become split. We become torn. We become destabilized. The foundations of our life are unstable. No, says the author of Genesis 1, there is only one God. And he alone deserves our full focus, our full attention, our full worship. Start here. First this, God. There is only one God. The second foundational truth of Genesis 1 is that God is a good God. One God, God is a good God. Did you notice the almost pulse-like beat throughout the text? Did you notice that? God does something, he speaks, he creates, he makes, and then comes the phrase, God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. Verse 4, verse 10, verse 12, verse 18, verse 21, and verse 25. God saw that it was good. These are the good actions of a good God. And again, this might not sound too radical to our modern ears. I suspect if I asked some of you, what do you think God's like, the word good would probably come up in your top 10 words describing him. Yeah, he's God. He's good, right? But this is mind-blowing stuff when you compare it to the other creation accounts of the time. Those accounts start with God's plural, who are vindictive who are engaged in power struggles and often at war with each other. In one creation account, creation itself is made from the bloodied corpse of a fallen god, which is ripped in two, and one half is used to make the sky, and one half is used to make the earth. Humanity itself comes out of discontent and rage. Some of the gods are angry that they have to provide food, and they say, make humans to be slaves for us and give us our food. So humans are made out of conflict and anger, and at the end of it all, The gods regret ever having made humanity, and they spend a long time trying to wipe them out. Can you see how dramatically different this creation account is? Here there is God, unchallenged, without needs, and all-powerful, creating order out of chaos, creating an environment for humanity to thrive in creating a world with possibility and growth woven into it, a world which provides food for humans rather than demanding that they provide food for God. And all over it, all throughout it, is this pulse-like beat of goodness. It is good. It is good. It is good. Why? Because it is made by a good God. The dominant theme of Genesis 1 is a good God creating out of joy and delight and excitement. There's another even earlier creation account in the Bible. It's found in Job chapter 38. And there we read that not only is there this pulse-like beat of goodness, but there's also, while this is all going on, a deafening, glorious roar. God says, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations, while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted, for joy. The biblical picture of creation is one of a party. It is a celebration. It is a thunderous, ear-deafening, glorious chorus which focuses around the work of a good, good God creating a good, good world. Can I suggest that that is both as glorious and challenging today as it was 3,000 years ago. 
Because instinctively, when we look at a mountain or a sunrise, something within us soars, our heart soars, and we instinctively say, this is amazing, this is magnificent, this is good. But, but, what about those parts of creation that do not seem good? Flooding, hurricanes, earthquakes. And coming perhaps more to the heart of the matter, what about those parts of our lives that do not seem good? Disappointments, sickness, and death. How do these things fit with a good, good God? Well, some of the answers to these questions will be answered in coming weeks when we look at Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. And then we're going to learn how this good God created her humanity, who incidentally was very good, and also free, free to make their own choices. We're going to learn that even when humanity chose to turn away from God, God refused to turn away from us. And he decided to embark on a rescue plan that was both as magnificent as it was costly. A plan which involves sending his son Jesus to die for us so that we might be part of his new creation. But for now, allow me to draw your attention to a detail in Genesis 1, which I think might help us as we seek to live in a world which is created good, but which contains things that are not good. Take a look with me at verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Let's pause there. Formless and empty. In the Hebrew, those words are tohu vavohu. Tohu vavohu. And um, they are describing a sort of wild, utterly uninhabitable wasteland of a place. What does God do with this wild, chaotic, dark, terrifying environment that is utterly uninhabitable to humans. What does he do? He brings order out of it. God speaks, and out of the chaos comes light. God speaks, and out of the deep comes dry land. God speaks, and out of the chaos comes life, abundant life. God is a God who brings order out of chaos. That is who he is. That is what he does. And if you want further proof of this, just look at the life of Jesus. God incarnate. See what he did when he lived here. When confronted with chaos in nature, through storms, Jesus spoke. Peace. Be still. Order out of chaos. When confronted with chaos in our bodies through sickness and disease, Jesus spoke, be healed. Order out of chaos. When confronted with the ultimate symbol of terrifying chaos, death itself, Jesus spoke, it is finished. Dying so that death might be forever defeated. Ultimate order out of ultimate chaos. And one day, because of Jesus' sacrifice, God will make all things new. He will restore creation to all that he intended it to be. Order without chaos. Chaos will not have the last word. God will. Full stop. But until then, until then, our good God promises to be with his creation to be with us as we face the chaos that is still part of this broken world. How? Let's continue with verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God is with us through his Holy Spirit. The one whom Jesus literally described as the helper. Not only does the Holy Spirit continue to hover over creation... But if we have accepted Jesus' offer of forgiveness, he lives in us, working with us in order to bring order out of the chaos of our own lives, working so that we can say with the Apostle Paul, we know that in all things, no matter how chaotic, God is working for the good of those who love him. Why? Because that is what he does. That is who he is. God is a good God. God brings order out of chaos. 
Despite what culture, society, and the enemy of our souls wants us to believe, there is only one God, all-powerful, and he is good. And what he does, including what he creates, is good. And this means that despite the chaos you find yourselves in, we can trust him. This is the start of everything. This is the truth. This is foundational. Build your lives on these truths, and you will not be shaken. To finish, I'd like us to answer one question, just one. What do you think God is like? What do you think God is like? Because that's one of the core questions that Genesis 1 is seeking to answer, isn't it? What is, what is God like? To help us answer this, if you feel comfortable, I'd like to invite everyone to close their eyes. Um, I'm going to keep my eyes open so I can read my notes, but if you feel comfortable, do close your eyes. And I'd like us to think about our weeks ahead, this coming week. And specifically, I'd like you to think about Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Some of you will know exactly where you're going to be and what you're doing. Others of you will just have more of a vague idea. Maybe you'll be sitting in a lecture, watching TV, writing an email, doing a presentation, unloading the washing machine, caring for someone. And as you think about your coming Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., I want you to imagine that God is with you there in whatever it is you are doing. And he's watching you. Pause what you're doing for a minute and look at him. What is God doing? What do you think God's feeling? What might God want you to know? With your eyes still closed, let me tell you what I think God might be doing based on Genesis 1. I think to start, God is smiling when he looks at you. This might make some of you feel really uncomfortable. Perhaps you don't feel worthy of his smile. But you are. You are. And then I think God might want to say, I see you and I love you. Whatever it is that you're doing, I see you and I love you. Pause for a second. Let that sink in. The creator of the universe who made the stars also sees you and loves you. Now take a moment to tell God, and by tell him I just mean pray, <laughs> some of the chaos that you are facing. It might be specifically and directly related to Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Or it might be something completely different. And then why don't you ask for his help? You might want to simply pray, Creator God, please, please bring order out of my chaos. If you would like, feel free to carry on in that attitude of prayer. But I'm going to invite the worship bands up. And we're just going to take a bit of time now to engage with Creator God. To worship Him. Maybe for some of us, we just have to say, I'm sorry for worshipping other gods. I'm sorry for letting other gods tell me how to live my life. I'm sorry for bowing down in worship to them. I worship you alone now, Lord. I plant my flag here. You are my God. Why don't we stand together and I'll pray for us. Holy Spirit, would you just come now and would you just hover over us? Would you be showing each and every one of us that you are a good God, that you are a God who brings order out of our chaos and that nothing is impossible for you, Lord.
we wait on you and we worship you.